Our next panel, which is the industry perspective, uh, Mr. Nate Bradley, Executive Director with California Cannabis Industry Association, uh, Hezekiah Allen, Chair and Executive Director for the California Growers Association, and Keith Stephenson, Executive Director of the Purple Heart Patient Center. My name is Christy Noblick. I'm um, excited to be here to um, provide some feedback, so thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm the owner and uh, co-founder of Kiva Confections. We're a chocolate uh, manufacturing company, edibles company, uh, located in Oakland. And we also do um, distribution throughout the state. I'm here um, as a member of uh, CCMA and CCIA, the California Cannabis Industry Association. Um, I sit on the, uh, on the board of directors there, and I also chair the manufacturing committee. Um, the uh, CCIA has worked with, um, with the legislature to, um, to provide feedback on both MRSA and Prop 64, and we're excited to continue to do that with you, to um, work together and um, provide some uh, collaboration so we can make sure we get the system done right. Um, as a part of the association, we've uh, created 12 major points that we are looking to uh, focus on. Um, I'm only going to talk about four today. Um, but to, uh, to highlight, we really want to uh, emphasize the importance of one system. So medical and recreational coming together, and we think that will um, ease in the ability to uh, become compliant. So um, one of the first items is um, the importance of a phase-in with the licensing uh, program. So uh, Lori Ajax mentioned this earlier as well, but the ability for a um, licensed business to also be able to work with unlicensed businesses for a set amount of time. And that will just allow the industry to um, get going and won't, uh, won't bring things to a complete standstill. Um, the other item is uh, the thresholds for ownership. So currently MRSA um, has 5% ownership. Uh, we'd like to see that um, come up to where Prop 64 is with the 20% ownership. Um, the concern there is with a 5% ownership component, there will only be, or there'll be a, a restricted access to capital. Um, and that could potentially stifle growth for our new and growing um, industry and also could, uh, could present problems for publicly traded companies. If 5% is that threshold for ownership, they may be coming in and out of compliance um, uh, as a publicly traded company. Um, so we'd really like to see 20% on that ownership component. And then um, also we'd like to um, see the elimination of the cross-licensure uh, licensure restrictions with MCRSA um, to allow vertical integration, like just like we see it in Prop 64 that's been proposed there. Um, so MRSA is restrictive and um, Prop 64 has that uh, vertical integration component. Um, and then uh, finally, the last issue, and this one um, is of the utmost importance to me personally and to um, the groups we represent, is uh, distribution. And so um, we would like to see the, uh, the distribution component that's brought up in uh, Prop 64 um, com uh, versus the one that's in MRSA, which requires a third party independent um, distributor as a manufacturer, a large component of my business and really of the way that the industry is operating right now allows for both manufacturing and distribution. Um, so we're, we're uh, definitely concerned that um, restricting the amount of distribution licenses just to those who are solely doing distribution um, could have serious implications on the industry and uh, specifically around um, uh, innovation and kind of the uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurialistic spirit of California. Um, so we would like to be able to bring products, see products brought to market um, through manufacturers, cultivators, um, everybody having access points um, in terms of distribution. So thank you. Thank you. Please, Mr. Stevenson. I, will, I wish to speak about a few topics. One is multiple permits under one roof, also known as co-location. Uh, definition of premise, also suitability, also known by some cities as equity-based permits. Um, modify the closed distribution model under the MRSA and allow for both third-party distributors and licensed in-house distributors owned by licensed cultivators, manufacturers, and or retailers. And eliminating cross-licensure restrictions in the MRSA by allowing vertical integration as currently authorized by Prop 64. Um, my name is Keith Stevenson. I am the owner and operator 
of the Purple Heart Dispensary, Purple Heart Patient Center Dispensary, which has been serving patients since September the 18th, 2006, and is the longest running dispensary in Oakland. As a former resident of Los Angeles, I went to aviation maintenance college and became a licensed technician for United Airlines for 17 years before two hip replacement surgeries forced an early retirement, which led to my involvement in the medical cannabis industry. I started Purple Heart from the ground up and currently have 26 employees. I am the textbook definition of a small business owner. I am fortunate that, unlike some of my colleagues, I have not been incarcerated, nor do I have a criminal record. I am also fortunate that the cannabis industry has given me and has opened many other doors that would not have happened in other fields. Before I give my input on a path forward in the new cannabis world, I would like to thank Ms. Ajax and her staff as I was the second dispensary they visited and I appreciate their efforts to make themselves accessible and learn about, the, and learn about my industry. While distinctions between the medical and adult use cannabis frameworks are important, discrepancies, discrepancies between the two frameworks will complicate implementation for state and local agencies and make compliance more difficult for licensees. With that stated, key points include multiple permits under one roof, also known as co-location. Multiple permits under one roof is helpful to the geographic fabric and zoning of cities. This maintains the composition of businesses in certain hubs, helps create natural clusters, and is beneficial to public safety as the businesses are easier to monitor. Whether it's a dense urban city or smaller rural city, consolidating various usage and permits into one location is a better use of space. As an example, a medical, excuse me, as an example, a medicinal cannabis campus, similar to what biotechnology companies or public private research centers do, should be encouraged. <clears throat> Excuse me. Definition of premise, similar to the previous topic. The final definition of the word premises, as determined by the licensing entities, will have a significant impact on local ordinances, <clears throat> as well as on a licensee's ability to legally operate one state license or issue. With so many cities and, and counties banning or severely restricting cannabis businesses in their communities, it is critically important that multiple licenses, both medical and non-medical, be permitted on one premise. This model will allow cannabis businesses to relocate to locally approved hubs, encouraging <coughs> excuse me, the creation of natural clusters and minimizing potential impacts to public safety as clustering multiple businesses in one location is easier to monitor and regulate. Suitability, also known by some cities as equity. The war on drugs has been a war on low-income people of color. As part of the remedy, AMA must benefit low-income people of color and low-income communities of color. Any efforts by proponents of mass incarceration to roll back the sentencing reforms to limit community reinvestment or to create barriers to economic participation by persons with limited capital or prior drug rep records would undermine <clears throat> excuse me, basic fairness of the act and reinforce the institutional racism of the war on drugs. Considering that men and women of color have been disproportionately punished by the war on drugs and suffered immense harm, many individuals with past drug offenses on their records have been excluded from participating in this new industry thereby furthering historic inequities. <clears throat> Modify the closed distribution model under the MRSA and allow for both third-party distributors and licensed in-house distributors. Thank you so much. Cheers. Owned by licensed cultivators, manufacturers, and or retailers. Strict tax, excuse me, strict track and trace requirements in the MRSA language will already be tracking cannabis products from seed to sell. The state already has the authority to audit the operation of all licensees. Mandating that, <coughs> excuse me, mandating that distribution only be performed by an independent distributor will not reduce or prevent unlawful diversion and could have the unintended effect of increasing diversion and earlier points in the supply chain prior to the distribution choke point. My last topic, eliminating cross-licensure 
restrictions in the MRSA by allowing vertical integration as currently authorized under Prop 24. The MRSA language places restrictions on the number and type of licenses cannabis businesses may acquire. Prop 64 does not include prohibitions against cross-licensure and permits an existing vertically integrating small business in the industry to be licensed by the state without forcing it to divest itself of any part of its enterprise. To facilitate enforcement and compliance, there should be parity between cross-licensure rules and the medical and adult use cannabis regulations. With that, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Allen, please. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure, great responsibility to be here today discussing the path forward after Prop 64. Chair Caballero, Chair Salas, Chair Wood, and indeed Chair Ridley Thomas. Um, we think all four of your committees mm -hmm. need to play a very important role in this going forward. My name is Hezekiah Allen, Executive Director of the California Growers Association, membership organization with more than 900 members, 40 board members representing communities in 17 counties from LA to Humboldt. My comments today focus on closing the gap between MCRSA and Prop 64. First and foremost, cannabis cultivation is agriculture and should be regulated by the Department of Food and Agriculture. Chair Caballero, your presence today and your committee's attention here is, is a great uh, breakthrough in this policy area. And I'm going to primarily direct my comments to you and, and Vice Chair Mathis, though he stepped out of the room. First and foremost, one size that does not fit all for cultivation licensing. Both Prop 64 and MCRSA in, uh, have tiered licenses. MCRSA contains cottage specialty small and medium to ensure that regulatory requirements and fees are appropriately scaled to the size of the grow. Prop 64 creates all of these licenses with the exception of the cottage cultivation license. Additionally, Prop 64 creates the type five unlimited scale license in 2023. When it comes to cultivation licenses, we have two recommendations and a word of caution. We would like to ensure that the type one C cottage cultivation license is carried from MCRSA into Prop 64. We would like to restrict the type five license created in Prop 64, at least until such time as the federal government authorizes out of state sales. Word of caution, California is already overproducing cannabis. Going bigger isn't going to make regulating any easier. We recommend that this legislature maintain limits on the scale of each grow while continuing to ensure unlimited licenses will be available for small and specialty growers. When it comes to hemp, Proposition 64 is a big step forward. Hemp is a huge opportunity for farmers with lots of flat acres, marginal soils, and who might have some issues with water. If they need a resilient crop that can be used for a lot of different things, this is the answer. However, there are some very real challenges, both legal and operational, and we encourage the convening of an informational hearing focused specifically on implementation of measures related to hemp. It really is that big for our farmers. There's a critical code section in the MPR, M MCRSA that was omitted from Prop 64. BMP Code Section 19328 establishes restrictions on the types of business licenses that an entity may hold simultaneously. Because the section was omitted, Prop 64 opens the floodgate to consolidation and conglomeration. We call on the legislature to correct this with legislation. Our growers are especially vulnerable, and we do prefer the 5% threshold for cross-ownership. We would like to note that agricultural co-ops and existing code are a great way to achieve efficiencies and onboard investment capital without pushing independent businesses out. On the flip side, there's a critical section that was included in Prop 64 but omitted from MCRSA. We strongly encourage the legislatures to include the Prop 64 residency requirements in the MCRSA, ensuring that California businesses have adequate time to meet the requirements before the, the flood of out-of-state interests moves in. Unfortunately, Prop 64 and MCRSA both agree in the omission of a critical license type, non-storefront dispensaries. When we talk about balancing between access and neighborhood impacts, delivery services are a critical component. Over the last year, we have worked through with local government and law enforcement. There is no known opposition to these provisions at this time. They are included in AB 64. We strongly encourage the establishment of a non-storefront dispensary license in both Prop 64 and MCRSA. Oh, the marijuana tax included in Prop 64 is hugely problematic. We recognize that changing the tax language is going to be very difficult, though the task is simple. Conform the marijuana tax as closely as possible to AB 2243 and SB 987 that were deliberated by your legislature last year. Specifically, a very high concern, we think that the cultivation tax could be a barrier for entry for as many as 75% or more of the state's cultivators, if not clarified. The proposition is inconsistent in describing when the point of tax is due, when the product is harvested, when the product leaves the cultivation site, and when the product enters the commercial marketplace. That is a huge discrepancy in code. I've been a grower all of my life. 
I know that harvest is a long process. Times are tight. Money is tight. We need to shift that burden to the point where the product enters the commercial marketplace or else we just won't be able to make ends meet. That's all I got for today. Everything you've heard from the local perspective, from law enforcement, uh, from what the agencies are doing, I mean, do you agree, not agree? I mean, obviously there's still policy issues that we need to discuss, whether it's transportation or um, cultivation sizes or potency, for instance. But in terms of the coordination and the work together, are you, do you feel like that's fruitful, it's working, it's not working? I mean, how are you seeing this with your daily businesses? Sure. So um, I would say overall we've been engaged uh, multiple times by the um, regulatory bodies. So we've met a few times with the health department. Um, we've been to a few of the stakeholder meetings that Lori has put on. So um, I would say overall input, we've been able to um, define some pretty clear channels for giving input. And it seems as though, you know, we're, we're in February here, so we have a lot of work that still needs to be done. But I would say we're on the path to getting there. Um, a full implementation of the system in January still seems difficult. There's obviously a lot to be um, accomplished, mm -hmm. but uh, I think that the uh, industry is very willing to participate and um, and kind of people's hearts are in the right place. Um, the industry is very patient focused. Um, and so uh, the, with the best intentions, I think, I think we'll get there, so. I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate um, that and say that, you know, our experience with the agencies has been um, fantastic. You know, this has been a seemingly hopeless and impossible task from the time you guys set out to write the legislation. It took years to get to the breakthrough that the MCRSA was. Um, the reason that I maintain hope, maintain hope and confidence that this will get done is because of the coordination we've seen between the agencies, because of their access, because of how uh, available they have been. And so uh, we speak very highly of the work that they've done. It has to be noted that in the absence of regulation, there are a number of business models that have grown up that maybe aren't the, the, the way that the state would, would like to see our marketplace move forward. And so there is tremendous strain, particularly as those business models are disrupted. And and so we are trying to work through those tensions. Our organization has taken the approach of just tracking as closely as possible with non-traditional allies, local gov law enforcement, and really trying to present not just a unified industry perspective, but a unified stakeholder perspective. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's slow, it's tedious, but the agencies are giving us hope and confidence at this point. Okay. I'd like to say, personally, um, I think it's incredible what the state agencies have been able to do in a collaborative effort. My initial irritations were with the BOE, just trying to pay taxes. I was bounced around from Oakland to San Francisco to San Jose. And, you know, you're talking about carrying large sums of money only to pay a bill. And now that the state has taken appropriate actions and saying, hey, this is one of the premier issues that we've got to deal with is intake mm -hmm. of the revenue. I think that the fact that the state has come together and, and worked across board with all the various entities have shown a willingness to get this thing done for. Now you take into consideration where you have MRSA and Ms. Ajax and her staff and others were working towards a common goal. And then you, in, then you interject Proposition 64, as I would say, the goalpost has been moved. And, they are, and the state agencies are still doing a phenomenal job and working together mm -hmm. and seeing this through. It's, you know, just dealing with MRSA alone was a insurmountable task. And then you add to that and you exacerbate it by adding Prop 64. And, you know, I read these articles and it's, these articles are somewhat written in a, in a unfavorable manner towards uh, the state agencies as well as the legislators. And I just want to know from someone that's inside of this, looking out that I understand what you're dealing with and I, I appreciate the work that everyone's doing together. Thank you. Let me um, ask, because uh, you know, some issues were brought up and with your associations and with your businesses, you know, concentration in certain areas, um, edibles was another one. And, you know, just the public safety aspect. How are you guys dealing with those? What are the discussions you're having with folks uh, not just in your associations or things that you're hearing. I'm 
you know, like most people, if you're in the in the world, everyone's talking in, in that kind of industry or in that world. So how are you dealing with those issues? Well, when it comes to issues of, of having product and when the language takes place next year, uh, January 1st, we test all our products to the level uh, that we're comfortable with and right. it's higher than what the state probably would ask for. So the inventory that we have on hand, I believe that we will be in a position to continue to sell that inventory. However, based on what I'm hearing from the state, we're, we'll probably limit our purchasing power or abilities in the fourth quarter mm -hmm. and, and kind of just let everything bleed out. Mm. You know, I'll point to the um, over concentration issue um, and, and raise one of our membership's uh, primary concerns, which is under concentration. And ultimately, I think the best way of ensuring a balance between neighborhood impacts and access is to make sure that there's one or two stores everywhere and there's not two dozen stores anywhere. And so, you know, I, I, I definitely defer to the League of Cities in that regard with the local control issue. We are, we are definitely encouraging folks to. Um, be very mindful of their communities. For example, in Sacramento, we supported a community reinvestment fund that is a voluntary 1%. Um, down in, in your district particularly, Mr. Ridley Thomas, uh, we are working with folks on Measure M to ensure those considerations are included in the post-Measure D framework. Too many of these businesses in any one place and not enough in another place. They're sort of flip sides of the same problem. And what we'd like to get to do is get to a point where you know things are, are well-regulated, um, and you know, not banned and not concentrated. Ultimately, hit that hit that nice middle point. I, again, just working as closely with the league, with the with CSAC, with RCRC, with the various stakeholders who really know more about those topics, and trying to track very closely with them as we move forward. Thank you, please. Ms. Um, for when it comes to um, public safety for edibles, um, earlier Dr. Karen Smith from the DPH um, was speaking about the threshold set by the food manufacturing industries and um, cannabis manufacturing can get right on board with most of those um, with what's being done in the in the rest of the world. Um, so we need thresholds. So we need thresholds for pesticides. We need thresholds for microbiological contaminants. That will also um, potency as well. So um, that will main maintain consistency and potency from product A to product Z, batch after batch, year after year. Um, but that responsibility should um, be shifted to the manufacturer. That's also how it's done um, in the in the rest of the world um, and with regular food manufacturing. Um, so license holders will need to be hold, uh, held accountable for those um, thresholds and for meeting those. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think a huge area for um, to show kind of how responsible the industry is going to be is in marketing and advertising. And under no condition do any cannabis operators want to see their products consumed by children. That is bad for, bad for consumers, bad for business, bad for the industry as a whole. Um, so nobody, nobody wants that. Um, so part of the work that we've done with the manufacturing committee is um, come up, up with some uh, a code of conduct for marketing and advertising. And it's um, borrowed from the Distilled Spirits Council. Um, and it just talks about what we're not going to do, basically. So we're not going to show people um, overly impaired. We're not going to print um, you know, uh, Santa Claus on our marketing materials. It's very basic but very thorough um, points. And um, I think it's, there's a lot of education that we need to do uh, among the consumer base. Um, but there, there is certainly a responsibility on the side of the manufacturer to not make products that are attractive to children. But we also need to educate consumers on where to store them, for example. So they need to be out of reach of children. And kids need to know these products in this package or in this child-resistant um, exit bag, for Correct. example. These are not for kids. These are for parents. Um, yeah, and I think, I think once we start having those conversations, uh, we'll be well on our way to a yeah, responsible Yeah, I think that's system. what Dr. Smith had said was uh, opaque. Uh, could see the product and then the child resistant uh, features that are accompanied with them. Um, we are running short on time. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Ridley Thomas. I would argue that there's no such thing as under concentration in these businesses. <laughs> it's probably not even legally defined. And I'll take the two that would be in Lemert Park and give them anywhere else, anywhere else, literally. And while you say that the local governments are experts, they are not. They are simply stakeholders. The experts are the people who will bother me in the middle of the night when these businesses are overrun, particularly the dispensaries. 
Now, it's not the whole supply chain. And this is something that the voters in their wisdom decided to embrace. And many members of this legislature support. But it is unacceptable if this system is so porous that it allows for substantial concentration. And I will blow your phone up as it happens. One thing I would think that you can help us with in Los Angeles in the immediate notwithstanding Measure M will be whether or not we can get the unlicensed businesses or these different business models to quickly come into the marvelous light. And the, they are, there's only so much that local government, the community groups that the press can do the industry is going to have to step up. So that's, I'm not necessarily asking for a response, but with due respect, because of how over-concentrated it becomes, there will not be many of these facilities in the Palisades. And I'm quite sure, I didn't look at all uh, how it passed, but it passed a little higher on the west side than it did in South Los Angeles. It passed in South Los Angeles. Y'all did a good marketing job. But um, there's, it's, it's just not even, it's not even comparable what happens to Ms. Noblick from the, the Industry Association. To this legislator's ears, it sounds like that you're arguing in your opening statement for less regulation. That's unacceptable. That will not be something that will hunt. Now, Oakland is different from Los Angeles. The Bay Area was much more accepting of various types of marijuana being distributed in your areas. Good for you, good for the people that you work around. That's not the same in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Nor will it be tolerated when things like cash uh, carrying businesses get robbed, stores get broken into, and we have uh, concentrations of individuals who are trying to access these services if they're not using one of the mobile distribution services. So it's a little different, uh, the argument that you bring, but regulation in and of itself and the reduction in regulation is an unacceptable argument for this type of industry. So I would caution that as you come and testify in your industry association, that you pay your membership dues and you employ advocates to market on, reduced regulation is an unacceptable argument. It doesn't even stand to reason because of things like being able to test whether or not somebody is intoxicated. Yeah, and I That's think not those even the word. Mr. Ridley Thomas, things that we discussed in the earlier panel. I get it, but, 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 but Mr. Chairman, to be clear, this witness spoke to that in her opening, that they wanted essentially, in a condensed version of that, reduced regulation or the state to appreciate that the, uh, indus the industry is needed to mature. That's an unacceptable argument. That is really an unacceptable argument. The best case scenario for this would be something like three tiers where wholesale, retail, and distribution are separate and do not have ownership stakes. And capital, frankly, will come to the market. Capital will come to those businesses. And just because you want to profit from one part of another, maybe some something of which you have to give up for being in this industry is to not be able to have different parts of the supply chain. But to me, that is an unacceptable argument to have reduced regulation in what is essentially a, a nuisance industry. And I refuse to allow us to normalize this discussion. And it is different for different areas. That's all I have to say, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. So I think uh, you've made your your point and where you stand on these issues. And um, I think when Ms. Noblick, I think it was, was talking earlier, it was about the different tiered sections for transportation. Um, I'm trying to figure out, just for clarification, are we moving – you're not asking – for less, the way I heard it was not less regulation, but that we move to a regulatory body within the scheme work of the two propositions that have passed. And I think that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, yeah. I th I'll uh, just respectfully um, clarify what I meant to say there. So I think that um, the two points I was trying to make was that businesses that don't have a license will be able to work with businesses that are getting up to speed, or I guess those that have licenses and those that don't have licenses will be able to work together for, um, for a set amount of time. Um, but I think where I misunderstood is um, in allowing a, a vertical integration. Was it potentially that? So um, 
we just prop 64 allows for vertical integration so um, we're not suggesting that we go outside of either of those two systems but that we uh, bring MRSA closer to what we're seeing in prop 64 so um, I don't I guess I'm I think we need I think our industry needs regulation um, you could take a look at my business we've been operating as though we've had regulation for six years we test all of our products as um, Keith had mentioned they do as well we test all of our products for food safety um, for microbiological contaminants for potency and um, I can sit here and tell you very uh, honestly that I fully believe that we need safe products out there and we need to make sure the right players are operating in the right way so um, by no means do I think the industry needs to continue how it's been because um, we're we've grown up past that and it's time to it's time to adopt sensible responsible regulation so respectfully chair a brief comment related to vertical integration and 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 the independent mandate for distribution um, and to be clear uh, chair Ridley Thomas our organization did not support prop 64 for some of the very reasons I think that you point out we, we think it relaxed regulations too quickly of course there's a concern about regulatory capture from the government's perspective our, our concerns are more focused on on market capture but they are are very similar uh, pieces of the same issue um, you know we we don't see Prop 64 as relieving the mandate for a licensed distribution tier in the supply chain. We simply see that it's allowed to be cross-licensed with other licensees. This will, in effect, create uh, one of the worst outcomes whereby well-capitalized, well-positioned businesses will be able to vertically integrate, realize those efficiencies, and, and gain a competitive advantage, while the smaller, most vulnerable businesses, particularly the growers, will continue to be left working with an independent distributor because they simply can't afford to cross-license. The micro-business uh, license type that was created by Prop 64 does create some relief to this, but at the end of the day, um, what we want to be very careful about is that as we ease regulations, which I think you know some stakeholders are, are certainly calling for, um, we don't want to do that in a way that it disproportionately benefits well-capitalized businesses. That that if we if we do ease those restrictions, but it's a very high financial burden, will produce some of the worst outcomes possible. And so, just wanted to be um, attentive to that issue. We do tend to prefer the more regulated framework in the MCRSA as a starting point. And as we get our bearings as a marketplace, as we figure things out and have better data, then we can move forward into a more relaxed framework. All right. Thank you. And I know uh, everyone's working hard to create that regulatory scheme work and framework for us to, to operate off of. We'll continue to have additional hearings to talk about some of these things. And I know we'll be debating some of these policy areas in terms of vertical integration, transportation, tiered, not tiered system uh, in the near future as we continue to move forward. And I know I believe each of the chairs have probably talked to each of the departments as well and a number of the stakeholders that continue to come into our offices on these issues. So um, definitely looking forward to those discussions. But Mr. Wood? Yeah, just, just, <clears throat> just a comment, kind of a clarification. You know, when MCRSA was put together, one of the reasons that we looked at, at limiting vertical integration was, was the desire to keep businesses smaller. Um, and so, I, you know, grandfathering in existing businesses that are vertically integrated isn't, isn't an issue for me. What I'm concerned about is the mega business that comes in grows in an unlimited scale or limited only by geography or water or whatever at huge scales that, that, that can then um, test their own products, manufacture their own products, and sell their own products in their own stores. I don't know of any other industry out there that does that. Certainly not, you know, at that at the scale at which that. And so that's one of the concerns that, after hundreds of hours of deliberation with the legislature, we chose to do it a certain way. So obviously we see we see a conflict. We see a conflict here. Um, distribution from the the legislat legislature's perspective was a tax collection point, primarily a tax collection point. So what I don't, what I didn't see in Prop 64, which I still fail to see, is how we're going to reconcile that. Because how are we going to collect the taxes, which was a big push by the coalition uh, of how we were, how this was going to play out well for California, billion dollars in taxes. 
where are we going to collect those taxes without some sort of a component related to distribution or testing or something? So how that all comes together so that the promise of the taxes for the legislature to protect kids, to, to protect the environment, to, to protect against the black market is actually realized. So we'll see how all of this, all of this plays together. Um, but, you know, certainly from a business perspective, the concept of unlimited vertical integration, I think um, there's, there's a challenge there that, that certainly is in, in, in huge conflict with, with what the legislature envisions. So we'll see how it plays yeah, out. We probably could have a whole hearing just on that, <laughs> <laughs> just on this, this one topic. Mr. Stevenson, please, and let's move yes, on. Yes, when, when we speak of vertical integration, one of my most expensive... Uh, line items in our budget is purchasing cost of goods. If I'm able to produce the majority of the things that I need in-house, that allows me to be a much more fiscally responsible business. And I operate under the premise that when I initially started doing this, people went to jail. So as the industry has chosen to grow up and expand, I've been forced to grow my business, which, you know, either I can do it if I want or I don't have to. I'm choosing to do it. What I do not want is for the Legislative Assembly to limit the size and growth of my business. I'm not concerned about anyone coming from outside with unlimited amounts of money. I'm not, considered, I'm not concerned about any multi-conglomerates because as long as there's a, a, a federal state issue, they're not going to come into the space. I don't anticipate these businesses coming to the space for at least 10 years. Mr. Riley Thomas and Mr. Silas, you come from areas, you represent areas that have high unemployment. I, I'm very aware of your area, Mr. Riley Thomas. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. This is an emerging paradigm, an emerging market that has the opportunity to gainfully employ those individuals who are unemployable. I asked you to look at this in a different light. I understand what you're dealing with in L.A. The issue in L.A. is not with the industry, it's the lack of oversight by the city of Los Angeles. We don't have those issues in Northern California. So when you guys, and I'm not being gender specific, when you all <laughs> look at this business model, I want you to look at it with a clear, concise state of mind. That this, has been, that this has been permitted since 1996, and it's time for the industry to grow up. And please do not limit me by legislative laws. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for your comments and for being here. Obviously, like I said, we could probably have a hearing just on this, and we will have a, an additional follow-up hearing because I know there are other associations and alliances and whatnot that weren't able to be on this agenda because it was already packed. Uh, you know, we started working on this hearing last year right after the proposition passed. So uh, we'll continue to hold, hold another one um, as, we can, as we move forward for this upcoming year. And then obviously we'll do the oversight as, legis as uh, legislators in coming years to see how everything's going along. But thank you guys for your testimony and thank you for being here.